Welcome. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Kitchana Bemitzvotav Vetzivanu La Sokbedivre Torah. So I went over the Re'em some more, and my sense about it is it's very difficult to totally understand what he's talking about at this particular point. He gets, I think, pretty technical, and I don't know that we need to get into such technicalities at this point, given the fact that we're really going through this for the first time. So I think what I'd like to do is go back to the Rashi and continue with the Rashi. If I felt that struggling with Ra'im was going to be very satisfying in the final analysis, uh, I would keep going at it. Uh, but I've gone over it a few times and uh, trying to get a clear picture of what he's talking about. And I think he's he's talking about, perhaps he's talking about why Rashi doesn't comment initially when the whole issue of hardening Pharaoh's heart comes up and why he waits until this particular point to do it. I think that's what he's talking about. And again, I'm saying, I think that's what he's talking about. Um, and how he supports Rashi as to why Rashi does it here and doesn't do it earlier on when God initially tells him to go to Pharaoh. So with that, I will start to share a screen. And so we are doing a Rivii. We're at the Rivii. We did this. Let me see. I think we already did this verse. Oh no! Okay, well, well, we may start. We may have started the verse. I don't think we got too far with it. All right. Vayomer Hashem el Moshe ve'el Aharon leimor. So Hashem said to Moses and Aaron these words, right? Saying, "Ki yedaber alechem paro leimor." When Pharaoh, when Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, saying. Tnu lachem mofet. You give me, you give me a sign. Va'amarta el Aharon, and you should say to Aaron, Kach matcha, take your rod, va'hashlech lifnei Pharaoh, and cast it before Pharaoh, yehi letanin, let it be a serpent. I don't know that we've discussed this so much, uh, but the serpent, we may have actually made a mention of it, that the reason for the serpent has to do with the symbolism of Pharaoh himself and the fact that a rod represents uh, authority and and the ability to, uh, to actually um, put into effect that authority uh, and that that this, this actually had symbolism before it, besides the fact that it was miraculous, but it was in a sense telling Pharaoh the rod of punishment was gonna come against Pharaoh. That in a sense, this was a, an actual foreshadowing of all the makot. Uh, makot means to beat and all the plagues that were to happen. Let's take a look at the Rashi here. So he talks about um, ma, ma, mofet, uh, the word mofet, ot. He says it means a sign. Lohodia, sheyesh tzorech, or other texts say uh, tzaruch, or um, bemi sheholech etchem. It's a sign to show him, to let him know that there is, now tzorech normally means a need, a need. And a tzroch, tzroch, that's the word here, also means, it means power. So in some ways, this, this, this emendation appears to make more sense in this context. Bemi with the one sheholech etchem, who is sending you. So this, as Rashi's understanding this, the fact that they're able to do this uh, actually indicates a power behind them that is able to enforce. That's the idea of the rod, the enforcement of what they're going to do. And need, of course, could mean something else. Then, in fact, uh, there one, one depends that Pharaoh needs to recognize that there is a greater power. That, in fact, 
humanity, right? If we were to extrapolate all the way, that humanity actually has great need in the divine, in God's power. Vayavo Moshe Aaron el Poro, Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, Vaya Asuchain, and they did this. Ka'asher Tziva Hashem, as the Lord commanded, as Hashem commanded. Um, interesting, right? The, the subtle message there of, of the whole point of what our lives are about, which is to try and do what Hashem commands us, that that's really our responsibility as human beings, that underneath that is the very purpose of living. Um, at least ultimately, you might say, uh, there's a process to get there, which is to learn what God wants of us. And that's the greatness of studying Torah, is that it, it basically lays out for us in various ways what Hashem has in mind for us. In other words, it provides purpose. And so have, sensing as human beings that we have a great purpose, right? Because if the purpose is actually towards something that goes beyond this life, uh, you've heard me talk about it very much at times, which is, has to do with significance and the sense that, that there's a great deal of human unhappiness because of a sense of purposelessness and a sense of lack of significance, which leads to all kinds of sad, sad if not bad behavior on the part of human beings, that there's a great deal of unhappiness and that, in fact, this is the reason why we, we hope that following this particular philosophy of life leads to some deep, deep, deep sense of inner joy. Continuing with the sentence, Vayashlech Aaron and Aaron cast et matehu his rod, lifne faro before Pharaoh, velifne avadav, and before his servants, vayhi letanin and it became a tanin. So the qu question Rashi translates tanin, it's, it's a word that sometimes gets translated as, believe it or not, a dragon, dragon sometimes. So at any rate, I think snake is good. So here he says, Rashi, very tersely, le tanin nachash. Nachash is the common word for snake. So something interesting happened, something that if we had never read the story before, we might find uh, surprising, right? Vayikra gam paro. So Pharaoh, also Pharaoh, called lachachamim to his wise men, valamachashvim, and to his wizards, right? Vayasu gam heim. And they too, performed Khartoumé. Who was it? Khartoumé, the sorcerers of Egypt, Mitzrayim, they also performed Belahatehem Chen with their spells and their enchantments. They were able to do this. Okay. Uh, so this is an interesting dynamic that's taking place. In other words, at least we would say that if we were to um, substitute the word scientists, I realize it's it's a strange way, but this is this was their practice. This was something that they they operated the way in which they operated in Egypt. And basically they were doing the same thing. And I think subtly, of course, that when human beings are able through their knowledge and through their understanding and through science to do these sorts of amazing things, what does it do? Right? The result is you say, well, look, uh, there's, no, there's no divine element here. It's, it's, it's fine. And nobody's asking, well, wait a second, you know, how does this very um, system of nature, you know, and the fact that we're able to control it in this kind of way, how did that get into existence to begin with? Or uh, otherwise, who gave us the intelligence? How come we somehow as human beings have such intelligence to do these sorts of things? So nobody thinks that kind of question. Nobody asks that kind of question. At any rate, we'll see what R Rashi says here. 
Belahatehem. It's a strange word in Hebrew, not common, it's going to tell you. And he says, Belachashehon, through their charms, through their incantations. And that's a, a Jastro, looked it up in Jastro. The Elodimion Bamikra. And he says, there is no, the word does not occur in, in, in a technical scholarly language, it's a hapex legomenon, meaning it's a word that occurs only once in the entire scripture. The yesh, but he says, but one can compare to it. One can make a comparison. Bereshit Gimel, going back to Genesis chapter 3, where we have a verse that says, lahat, right? So there is belahatehem, with their lahat. And he says, lahat hacherev, the, the lahat of the sword, Hamit hapechet, which is tur- which turns over the ever turning sword, right? So the lahat, what does this mean? Domer, it it is similar to this lahatehem, shehi mit hapechet, that the reason that the sword is ever turning al yedei lachash, because it comes, it happens through an incantation or through a charm or through sorcery. Uh, to refresh your memory, perhaps, regarding what we're talking about, we're talking about something that was placed at the entrance of the Garden of Eden to prevent a person from returning and gaining immortality. Uh, I actually think that uh, there's, I, I have an interpretation of this, that it's actually symbolic because the Garden of Eden represents a place where human beings can achieve immortality. And uh, what we're talking about, uh, again, uh, this is a pure speculation on my part, that it refers to human nature, that there is something inside of us. It's like what we would call within rabbinic, using rabbinic parlance, the Yetzirah, and that it's what prevents us from going back to this and going and studying Torah, that in some ways there's an, in a natural tendency of human beings to not want to do that, not want to study Torah, not want to do God's will, not want to, not, you know, the ain't no one going to tell me what to do kind of stuff. Uh, I could be way off. I'm just trying to find some symbolism in it. But that's the sense I have because we could call the Garden of Eden actually the world of Torah, that it actually is a Garden of Eden for us. And yet so few people comparatively ever go back into it. So, uh, Rabbi? Uh, yes. I have been reading a Jody Picoult book uh, that's called The Book of Two Ways, and yes. it has to deal with Egypt and archaeology yes. and they talk about the fact that a lot of things that are written in the tombs and on in in the coffins and things like that are spells interesting wow yeah so like they have spell books that yes. you know different things for that will create different different things mainly just to get to the afterlife but you know but it's yeah but they use the word spells I think that's so cool. Thank you. That's wonderful to yeah. have. And uh, again, so it was their science, right? It was for them, that was the way yeah. they, they approach it. And I also think it gives a lot of, uh, how can I say it, that there's a, and this I'm not the by any means the first one who's commented on, on this, but you look at the two great ancient civilizations, they essentially Mesopotamia and Egypt. And you see them as playing an important role in terms of the Torah and the development of uh, of Judaism. I mean, that's obviously an anachronism, but let's say the the religion of the Bible, the philosophy of the Bible. You see both these civilizations as uh, having a tremendous impact on what come on how we what we draw out of it, and. Um, Again, the I th- although I know Egypt had gods and Mesopotamia had gods, the idea of having one unique, ineffable, transcendent uh, deity that was behind everything 
is the unique part that that uh, brings these things together. And I want to mention that in terms of certainly in terms of rabbinic thought, uh, Greek civilization plays a very significant role in that as well. And even the methodology of the Talmud, right, can be found in in some of the the Greek debates that whole debating kind of way of getting greater knowledge, etc. The methodology. So it's not a question so much of originality, uh, that is to say, uh, universal re- originality. It has more to do with say st- taking advantage of something that has that ha- is capable of uh, giving great truth and being of great benefit to humanity but putting something behind that all that ties it together in a in a significant a really significant way because it's dealing with purpose and uh, with significance and things like that and and finding a way to answer those kinds of questions, right? The fundamental question uh, that people may not articulate, but I suspect is sort of lying at the bottom of everything is, what is the purpose of being alive? Why am I alive? What purpose do I have? Why did I come into this world? Why do I have a consciousness? Etc., etc. And trying to find wonderful and deep answers to that question. Golda, thank you so much for sharing that. That was very helpful, very interesting. So here goes, coming on with our narrative. Vayashlichu ishmatehu. So specifically, what were these sorcerers doing? They cast, each man cast their rod by you, the taninim. And they all became taninim, right? They all became serpents. However, vayivla mate aron et matotam. So it says here, interestingly, it says, the rod of Aaron swallowed their rods. The rod of Aaron swallowed their rods. So again, clearly there's some heavy going symbolism here, right? That as legitimate as what they were doing might have been. Nevertheless, it was going to be subservient to what Aaron was trying to get across. So Rashi, though, points out, and this is basis of a statement in the Talmud, Tractate Shabbat, uh, page 97. It says, Me'achar she'chazar v'nesa mate, that this happened after it returned and became a rod once again. Bala et kulam, it swallowed all of them. So I've obviously a, a miracle within a miracle, uh, the, but again, I think the point of it not being the serpent, but being the rod that swallowed their rods, again, uh, at least it forces me to to go for a symbolic meaning, the one that I gave you, because the rod part indicates authority, enforcement, etc., power, power. So in this case, divine power, symbol symbolizing divine power. We know that this is actually probably the symbolism of a king's scepter, right? That's that's the symbolism involved. Uh, the, so what happened? Okay, despite all this, despite all this that happened, I mean, put yourselves, you know, in this particular place, watching what's going on here. But it says, "Vayechazak leiv paro," Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Doesn't say God hardened Pharaoh's heart. It says basically Pharaoh hardened his heart. His heart became hard. The law shama alehem, and he paid no attention to them. He didn't listen to them. Kashir diber Hashem, just as Hashem spoke. So, the thought that goes through me right now is the degree to which, uh, when people want to hold on to something false or wicked, 
rational proofs or even what they see with their own eyes, which indicate, which would indicate uh, the falsity of it or the wickedness of it, when their hearts are in a certain way, they are not going to see it. They simply won't. And I'm not sure if it isn't in the little prince, le petit prince, uh, that particular story, for those of you who may have read it, where he makes a point of what do we see with and I believe, because this is from memory, he basically makes the point, we see with our hearts. We don't see with our eyes. And this is exactly what it's saying here. He didn't want to do it. He wasn't going to do it. And it didn't matter what logical arguments or what he saw with his eyes. And truthfully, we see such evidence of that going on today. It is almost unspeakable but the truth that we see with our hearts but i just want to mention yeah that it's not just evil people yeah. who have this problem yeah that very you know people who are very good to their families very good to their communities very sweet people mm -hmm. but when there's something hard truths um especially if it's not necessarily affecting them and their family directly it's something that they don't want to hear about, they don't want to see about. If you talk about it, they think you're being negative and get angry at you and whatever. It's just, you know, putting, you know, the, the proverbial putting your head in the sand. So it's, it's you know, maybe the action itself is, is you know, is, is it evil or is it a human flaw, but it certainly exists in, in all, you know, grades of people morally. Yes, no, 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 I appreciate what you're saying. I mean, the, the essential truth is that we see with our hearts. I was giving an example of wicked people. It, it was only an example. But the truth is sometimes we see, you know, that can sometimes actually be a good thing, especially when we love someone and, and possibly overlook some flaws in order to give them support and strength and things like that. So again, the, the essential message is we see with our hearts. This is a specific example of the, the inner dangers uh, that, that lie within that particular, in not realizing that and not being able to, I would say in this case, um, detach. Well, it's not necessarily that you have to deny the flaws of people you love, it's just that you have to be you know, tolerant and loving, even though they, as you do also, have flaws. It's, I think yeah. it's always good if you can acknowledge, you know, and, and deal with. Yeah, that's true, because I'm really saying more than simply overlooking, right? Even though that's what I'd like to say. This is actually a denial. You're right. You're right about that. Yeah. At any rate, again, the essential truth still lays there. And the problem is that when it involves wickedness, it really gets you into trouble, really gets you into trouble. But you're right. I mean, I think that's part of the reason why they may have statements like, you know, truth is the seal of God, right? And that the way in which to approach these sorts of things, uh, the, the problems and the difficulties is to acknowledge them uh, and and not necessarily hate them uh, and not to deny them, etc. I mean, the points that you're making, Lauren, thank you. So this is this is kind of where it comes down to. Um, incidentally, uh, as, as, as I've gone over this more and more and more and as I've gotten older about it, I am absolutely convinced that this story, even though it's cost in a sense, and may be seen by those as historical, quote, quote, I don't think that's the point. I really think it's talking about ourselves. I think it really is talking about human personality. And I think it is talking about, at least it's giving one, one example of the way in which we enslave ourselves. It's talking about personal enslavement and stubbornness and the difficulty that, that exists in trying to get past a point of view that looks at the world in a particular way, in a godless kind of way, and, and doesn't acknowledge something transcendent. 
And I think that's what this is about. And so the freedom, the freedom that we're talking about is the liberation of the soul, of the person. Going on though. Vayomer Hashem el Moshe. So uh, Hashem said to Moses, Kaved Lev Paro. Pharaoh's heart is, Kaved literally means heavy, heavy. Rashi is going to comment on this word you see here. Me'en, he refuses the shalach to send Ha'am, to send the people. He refuses. Rashi, and we'll, this will be it for today. Kaved, Targumu Yakir. He says the uh, Targum, the Aramaic, is Yakir. And again, this essentially means heavy, heavy. For lo, so there's a point that, make, that Rashi's making here, is that Kaved in, in this particular form could be a verb or a noun, right? So heavy is a noun, but uh, it's, it could also, at least the Hebrew, could uh, uh, be understood as a verb, right? That, uh, that, uh, he, that his heart has made something, has, has become heavy, or if there's a possibility of finding a verb, an English verb, to describe the process of being heavy. And it's an adjective, by the way. Well, yeah, I hear, I hear you. Okay. But not I, a noun. Okay. Well, okay, you're right. That would be heaviness. Right. Right. So thank you. I appreciate the correction. Velo ityakar. So ityakar would be the verbal form of this in Aramaic, right? So he says, Rashi says, at least mipnei shahu shem davar. He says, because it is the name of a thing. So the way I, I understood a noun, the definition of a noun, is that it's the name of a thing. Okay. So, Kamo, and he gives an example. Ki kaved mincha hadavar. So this is uh, in uh, the Torah, and it talks about a, a, a situation, this is Exodus 18, where something is too difficult to understand, okay? Um, so he says, for the thing, for the thing is too heavy for you. But Meaning, that's an adjective. Yeah, okay, well, Rashi's understanding it as a noun, okay, as a thing, the name of a thing. All right, um, and yeah. I mean, I don't really, I don't see how you could debate that. I mean, seriously, because right. you're saying something is heavy. That's, mm. you know, describing it, not right. naming it. I understand. And it's possible that, that we, that in English, as we understand English grammar, uh, we, we make that distinction. I don't know. It's a good point. I, I agree. But he's calling it the name of a thing. And Unless maybe, you want to call it stone. Wait, wait, I, have, I have a comment on that. Maybe he's calling it the heavy. Because it's the name of the heavy. Hold on a second. Uh, Lisa, I'm going to mute. All right, I'm going to mute, and maybe we can hear you better. It's hard to hear you, so I'm going to mute. Go ahead, try again. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that he is describing it as the heavy. So he's embodying the object as the in the heavy description, not in saying what the object is. It's embodied in heavy. Thank you. As a noun. You have to unmute, Rabbi. So the heavy heart. Or the, it's still but an, that's still an adjective. It's still an yeah, adjective. Still an adjective but. No, no, no. Okay. Heaviness, so maybe... heaviness is the noun. Okay. So we'd have to translate it as hev, he, Pharaoh's heart is heaviness. Okay. That would make it a noun. Or, or, mm. Yeah. Go oh. ahead. I'm trying to twist it, but it's not working. No, I mean, no, heaviness is fine. I was just trying to, because you said naming it, 
and and you also say name is reputation, mm. and and yes, that you know true. heavy could be its reputation or its name in that yes. sense. But grammatically, it's just not working. So even, yeah, I mean, even saying Pharaoh's heart has become heavy. But if it was a weight. But that's an adjective, so. Yeah, nope. it is. Wait, Judith, Judith said something really quick. Go ahead, Judith. Um, a weight is a noun. Couldn't it be a weight? Well, it, it definitely refers to heaviness. Sometimes kaved can mean important. Regardless, Rashi here is saying Shem Davar, the name of a thing. But even though we define nouns as the name of a place, you know, animal, person, or thing, it nevertheless, uh, uh, Lauren, of course, is correct in that heavy is an adjective. It's well, described because it's describing something, right? And that's what makes it an adjective. I'm just, my best bet here right now is to say that understanding the differentiation between a noun and an adjective may be a subtlety of English grammar, at least as it developed. But, but maybe he's not saying it's a noun when he uses the name of the thing. Right. He's talking about its character and yes. not necessarily, name, you know, right. pointing to the fact that it's a noun. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that my my translation, right, and that that's, you know, so I'm using an English word, an English translation, and that doesn't really fit, it, you know, it's calling it the name of a thing is what I have to call it. And that could be an adjective. And in this case, it is. It is an adjective. We that need could, Shirabeth. Yes, we do need <laughs> Shirabeth. True. Uh, so, um I think I think we do have some consensus, nevertheless, and so I'm going to place. Uh, I'm going to put the uh, marker here. With God's will, we will be doing this next year. We'll have to find out. Time will tell. But this is where we are, and I'm going to put the bookmark here. And we'll Mordecai, it. I believe yes. a state uh, of being is considered a noun. Uh huh. And heavy okay. heart is a state of being. Ah. Uh, okay. Well, that's that. That's helpful. Thank you, Karen. All right. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Let's. We're going to stop the recording here, and. Uh, Thank you all.